we're going to get ready for our next presentation with Daniel Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel Jackson is a Tulsa native, and he um, is the founder of Create Something Interesting, which is one of today's sponsors. Um, and he's released several video games on both Steam and Xbox, um, one of which was a game called Solos that made it to Xbox and actually won um, the CSGC competition in 2019. Um, so he's here today to give us a presentation on his new game, Blitz League, and to get some feedback from our audience. Mm -hmm. So take it away, Daniel. Right on. All right, everyone. So the main talk of this is a pitch for a company or the future of my company. And then afterwards, I want feedback on the pitch slash the game idea, everything and all that. But this is the rundown of my pitch. So I'm Daniel, and then I work at Create Something Interesting, and our focus is going to be making uh, competitive video games or esports. So our past games are Ramify and Solos. Uh, these are ones that we've made before. These aren't esports, though. These were just games that we made because we thought they should be made and they were important, and we put them out there in the world. So. Who is the actual customer that we are going after with competitive games? So this is the micro look at that of one person that we found. His name's Sam, he's 15, he has his own phone, he's an Xbox player, and he likes to play games with his friend. Her friends, not friend. So now the macro side of this, showing like who all is involved in the esports industry. Uh, we have GameStop, which is opening all of their stores are being converted to esports areas, and there's also esports arenas and stuff like that uh, opening up all over the place. High school esports e teams are opening up, and then college level. TU has a whole esports area and stuff like that, and then ORU is another local com or company, uh, college that just opened up one about two weeks ago. And so, uh, knowing who your customer is is great, but also knowing what they value is really important. And so they, on the car college varsity level college program, they wrote the actual values here so that you could see what those values are and what they want inside of their games. And so that's showing you the market of who we're actually going for. So there's 120 million Steam users and 111 PlayStation users and 110 Xbox users, we're not going after everyone. We're going after roughly 20 million people have the potential to want to buy this game. And so that's who we're going for. So eSports in general, this is a web that is supposed to be overwhelming because it's showing you the network of everyone that's involved in eSports. If it's players to doctors to media, anyone you have a place in eSports and this is kind of a machine and that machine, it eats eSports games, so it wants those eSports games so that it can build up, people can bring out, um, do tournaments, to live streams, to local events. On every level, there is some form of competitive thing going on, even news. So who's actually watching games? So this is August uh, 2019, so this is one month of people that were watching eSports. So we're not even talking, we're also talking about people watching it, not just playing it, and not just buying it, and how far of a reach esports can actually get. So, friction with current esports games. Uh, the first one is the install size on a lot of them are too big for, especially high school computers and older computers. You want something that is roughly eight gigabytes in size. Um, we talked to an all esports team, or all girls esports team, and there's also the notion that it's mainly female and we want to make sure that there's female representation in the game. There's also parents, a mom and dad that we talk to, they'll say like, oh, there's language in certain games and we don't want that involved. And then they're too violent. Uh, one of my favorites is Rainbow Six, but you can't really show that in a high school, you know? Um, not knocking that game, the game's actually amazing. Uh, things you can't Google. So we went out and did some research a lot of indie developers that are working in possible esports games, they're just hoping their game becomes an esport. They're like, oh, I can do this game and it has online play. It doesn't actually mean they're building it for esports. 
Uh, and there are also indie developers that are making these games and they run into the issue where they're saying, hey, I hope this game finds a market, whereas we're saying, no, these are the people we want to make a game for and we're going to build it for them. Um, and any game that is getting traction right now, they're really just getting it out of luck um, because the timing is right. So the big example of that is Splitgate, was just two guys that said, it'd be cool if we did Halo and Portal together and now it's kind of taking off that there's an esports scene, but the game, it's not taking the wildfire that it should be for what it actually is, because it's actually a great game. So other things we couldn't Google. Uh, when you're talking to players, they want to have the path to be the best. So not just, oh, we joined this league or team or anything like that, but in game, they want to show like, hey, we're the best and they want recognition. So inside the game, you need to have those sort of things and uh, in game, it's basically like, hey, the player of the week, this guy's doing really great. Or this girl, you know, she's the best defense, things like that. Those are sort of things you'd want to show off. Um, players need training and recovery. So these are athletes, so a lot of times they train, but a lot of tutorials aren't built around, hey, this is how you train to be an eSport athlete or e-athlete. I don't like that term, though. Um, and so those are the sort of things we want to do in game is have that sort of training there. Um, and then also a lot of people want to be famous and you need a platform for that. And so you want to make sure in game part of the recognition thing that they're able to like showcase who these players are and uh, what they're capable of. So why is now the best time to make an eSport? Because all the people that can build it, there's a ton of people at this school that are capable of building this sort of thing. The people that want to play it are available. They want these sort of games, they're on Steam, they're ready to go buy it. And then the network of people that actually want to watch it are available between uh, live streams like YouTube and Twitch. It's really easy to say, hey, like people want to watch this sort of stuff. And then my prediction is it's going to happen to an indie team that's working on a sort of eSport game just by luck because there's so many people wanting uh, this sort of product made. So what's the product we're going to make? We're calling it Blitz League. So it's four players versus four players. It's a non-violent first-person shooter, meaning instead of shooting bullets, we're going to shoot giant dodgeball-looking things. Um, there's a demo here in a second. So the idea is there will be levels built and balls will be dropped on the bottom, and then players will gather them and then work their way to the top towards a goal to shoot them into the goal. And then you have to go back down. And then throughout the level design, you have what are called congestion points that you'll either have to be offensive with or defensive with. So there's tons of layers of uh, difficulty within them. But what are we gonna do different? Uh, it's gotta be team-based everything, team-based tutorials. How many games do you go and you play and you're like, oh, I'm gonna join up on this team, but the tutorials are all single player, the tutorials aren't team-based. So you need, hey, I'm in with a group of people and we're gonna try and beat this tutorial. And those are the sort of things you wanna have right out the get-go, get that way teams can actually build day one of it releasing. Team-based leveling, so instead of, hey, I have my rank and I'm this, your whole team needs to level together and have a system in place that says, hey, this team will be a good match against that one, uh, we were going with the Elo Milo for initially, but then there's also uh, team skill was what they used for Gears of War, and we felt that that was another good option. So that's still in the works. And then team-based matchmaking, that also has to do with the Gears of War version of matchmaking and leveling system. So to sum up this slide and sum up the game in general, if it can be done as a team, it needs to be in this game. And if it can't be done as a team, it shouldn't be done. So why will people buy this game? The community of people, they're already ready for, hey, they want to join teams or they want to be, they're already joining real life esports teams. So it's not that big of a stretch for them to join a fictional one online. Uh, the price is really great because it's actually gonna be a free to play game. Uh, we're going to be using what are called vending machines, which are not loot boxes, even though they will look like loot boxes. Um, I'll go into that in the, later on. And then timing is right because people, they keep going for free-to-play free games and they want multiplayer games. Accessibility, we're trying to put as many accessibility things, everything from uh, hearing impairment and vision deficiency. 
I think that's how you say it, right? Uh, we want to have those sort of things. Uh, and chance and opportunity, we just feel like now is the time to strike on this sort of game. Okay, so we're talking about the game. So here are some gifts that may show up, may not. Uh, these are the balls that have to be collected. So as a player, you go around and then you collect balls. You can only hold 10 at a time, and then you have to shoot them. So the rules behind them are you shoot them, and then after seven seconds, they start glowing, um, and then at 10 seconds, they then explode. So these are kind of either a weapon or a curse for the player. Uh, well, I say that. So if I shoot one of mine and one of my teammates runs up to it, it's technically a passed ball, and so they collect that ball. So if I want to shoot up to a higher ledge, I just either shoot them or near them, and then they can collect that. But if an enemy hits it, they are then frozen for two seconds in time. Vice versa, if you hit one of the enemy balls, then you are frozen for two seconds in time. That's the dodgeball aspect. Um, so here is a passing happen. The guy shot, and then you're able to collect those balls. And then the next one is this is the actual freezing process that happens. Um, you're frozen and you can't do anything and it's very scary because you're in an online game and you're like, hey, I can't move, but it's part of the game, it's not a glitch. And so the last thing that we wanted to include is just because it's, we're trying to make things real, like, oh yeah, it needs to be a sport, it needs to do this, we need that like extra oomph. So this is athlete vision. So this is where any object in the game, you can focus on it. So if you want to focus on your teammate, you can do that. And then if you need to shoot and pass to them, then it'll automatically go that way. You have a, the part of the athlete vision is you have your um, goal here. You can press a button at any point and it'll always go to where the goal is. So you're never off on that. And then the other one is say, if I go to an enemy and I need to like hunt someone down, I can track on them and then go with that. And then down here, uh, it's not, I didn't make a gift for it you have a stamina bar so that you can sprint, jump higher, things like that, and use up your stamina bar. So here is the concept art for the logo that we first came up with. Uh, on the left is the drawing that we had made, and then on the right was the first 3D render of it. These are concept art, both the 2D and 3D are concept art, that's not final art. Uh, this is the concept art for what the outside of a stadium should look like. It needs to be kind of futuristic, kind of cool. And then this is the inside where you can kind of see the different layers of things and then the goals up on top and things like that. Um, this is a rendering of, this is some other show, an anime, but someone made a 3D model of it. And this is sort of the quality that we're going for to give you an idea. Um, because it needs to hit that eight gigabyte limit, it has to look cool, but it also has to be lightweight. And so we felt like this was that happy medium there. Okay. So things we're gonna do that other people wish they'd thought of. The first one is train, not just single player training, but also team-based training. Uh, perform, uh, this is where as a single player, you can basically go in and join any match and then find other players in a quick match sort of way. Um, but what it also does, it allows you to go into, if anyone's hosting a training mode, or not, a, I mean a recruiting mode, for their team, you can play with them and kind of get an idea of like if they're really good or not. And you do that and perform. And then recover, so this is uh, something I think is really important. You want, once someone's done with a game, to have a series of mini games to measure if they're actually improving, but also if they're approaching injury of any kind, like hey, you've been looking at lights too long, let's do some lighting tests and stuff. Uh, you guys understand what this means. How many of you guys played like WarioWare or any of those kind of games? Anyone? Okay, so the idea is it's like WarioWare sort of test to make sure, hey, this person is doing okay and they're actually not hurting themselves playing this. So it's kind of like, you know that seizure warning at the beginning of a game? It's kind of like we turn that into its own game to make sure that they're okay and not having issues. And then tournament mode. So this is where you would go through as a team and you rank up as a team and that's where you'd go through in tournaments. Um, the next one is you need 24 hour customer service for solving issues in the game and uh, tournaments because you want to have a huge grassroots effort. Uh, a lot of times any popular game, if you're having an error, you're looking at like a eight hour turnaround time before you can get something that's not an automated mes message. Um, you want to have that sort of customer service built in up front 
that way later on down the road when you're, you know, someone from the middle of nowhere, Kansas, calls you and you're like, hey, we're trying to host a tournament, you know, and get all that together, uh, they're able to actually put it all together pretty easily. Uh, spectator service, this is actually outside of the 1.0 version of the game, but you're able to watch games past and present and go through and watch those. And then accessibility modes, the outside of the built-in ones for, uh, we're using Unreal, they have the vision and the hearing ones, uh, but also a one button mode where you're actually able to play the game uh, with just one button. Uh, that's really complicated, but the rundown is, so say there's a team of four that's play, playing another team of four, there's actually a hidden team of four that will be uh, camera ops. So like when you're at a game, you know how you're looking out there and they have camera people? You'll have people that can't interact with the game, but they're camera people, but they can use literally just a thumb, and it's their own circuit that's kind of built up inside the game so that anyone, no matter what issue they have, can still play the game. But also, when we go to tournaments and stuff, they'll have their own kind of side league where they get to record the big tournaments and stuff like that built in. Um, and then build teams. Build teams in game. So uh, this is a small sentence that comes with a huge price tag. So basically the idea is I want to be a team owner, which means I can find 20 players in the game and then build out a clubhouse with those people. Um, there's a lot more to that, and that is outside of the 1.0 version, but I just wanted to have it in there. Okay, so uh, local tournament outreach. There, have you guys ever heard of Magic the Gathering? So like whenever you go to any of these card shops or anything like that, they have plenty of advertisement and they've reached out to mom and pop shops. No indie game has ever reached out to a mom and pop shop and said, hey, we need to market to these people so that our grassroots effort of this game can last for 10 years just because they threw a sign up and they're like, oh, do you still play that? Uh, there's things like that that you can do and then keep those relationships that no other game company is doing. Uh, also, we want to release within two years. That way, it's harder for other people to catch up because there are going to be clones. Everything in a video game, as soon as it comes out, within a week, someone's copied it. As soon as you release a trailer, within a week, someone copies it and brings it out. Um, and then the other thing is we'll be building up the brand as we are the esports makers of the future. All right. So uh, friction in the competitive space. Uh, not being able to be in most high schools, we want it at the eight gigabyte minimum. It not being broadcast safe. A lot of games, not just um, language or violence, but also the way the, like, the lighting works and stuff like that in game, only certain levels actually work for being broadcast safe and then certain colors for things. A lot of the engine takes care of that for you, but you want to make sure that it can be on TV. Um, it's not the end of the world, but eventually we'll be in a place where an eSport is at the Olympics and you want to make sure that that game is ready for that. And so the Olympics sent out a list of what they think would be broadcast safe for a game, and then we're going based on that and just building within their guidelines. Uh, and then it not being diverse enough. So this is actually twofold. I ran into a marketing game with my other games. If you guys can even remember what those games look like, they were like the second slide they aren't really rememberable. They don't have that silhouette of like, this is Mario, you know, something like that. So we want 12 different characters that are the default characters that are diverse. So someone, when they're playing it, they're like, I want to be like that person. Because the whole idea, it's like you're a superhero sort of thing. Like you have the athlete vision, you're the best. So you say, hey, I identify with this person, so I'm going to go and do that. Um, and that's how we allow for pretty much anyone in that marketplace to be part of the game. Okay. How do we get paid? So there's platforms, uh, Xbox, PC, um, and PlayStation. They all pay out once a month. So that means you only get paid 12 times a year per platform. Um, so just heads up when you make money, that's what happens. So there's other things we can do to get generate more income. The first one is licensing deals with actual brands to bring those into the game, uh, doing in-game promotion and out-of-game promotion, and then transmedia storytelling. Since we have so many characters that we're going with, you can build up books, comics, toys, TV shows, things like that. Okay, cool. All right, so how do we make money in-game? The idea is this. You have your clubhouse because you're a team owner, and you buy vending machines. And then if you buy a vending machine, it's $10 in the real world and say there's 100 items in it, but you have to spend so many balls per uh, item. 
So you get it at random and you have no idea what it is. The vending machine does run out. It's not a, oh, you always only have a 0.2% chance of getting the thing you want. As long as you keep going on the vending machine, eventually you will empty the whole thing out and get all of the items in it. But the vending machine is going to come out so fast, it's going to take you a while. Um, how does that in-game currency work? So uh, you buy the vending machine and that's real world money. It's not backed by anything because you can't sell or re-exchange the items. If you lose a match in Blitz League, say you scored 50, uh, your losing team did 50 points, right? That's all you got in that match. Then no matter what, even if you lost, you still get 50 Blitz, uh, Blitz points towards spending in your, your store. If your team wins, you get all of your team winnings plus however many of the team lost. So if the total score for a match, one did 100, the other one did 100, then you get 200 points that you can then spend in your store. So the more you keep playing and the more you win, the more that you can spend on your vending machine. The next one is the season pass. That's not like a normal season pass. This allows you to do a lot of online features that you couldn't. This is what gets you to be on top. Um, so this is, allows you to be the team owner to run your actual clubhouse and say, hey, you're on the team, you're not. So when someone's like, oh, some esports league that's some big hotshot, they're gonna have to spend just as much to start a, game, uh, start a team in game as you are. Uh, but also you can make your own logo and branding and then upload that in there uh, based around what in game objects are available. And you can only do that. And so that's gonna be a premium price, but it's going to be during the season. So. Um, and the season usually lasts around four months. Okay, so near future, so within the next 300 days, the idea is to get our old game solos on new platforms, basically PlayStation. So that's PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5. We already have the game built, it's all ready. We're just porting it and then bringing in income. But that also gives us uh, the ability to be on PlayStation for Blitz, uh, which we kind of, uh, which we really want. Then the next one is our first test run into uh, eSports will be available tomorrow to play on the show floor, and that's called Bout. And it is, you'll play it and you'll be like, this is an eSport? And it's like, no, it's all the workings and all of the ideas of an eSport um, in there, but we're gonna give it as a free-to-play game out there in the real world, and then it'll have also DLC. So all of the questions of like, how are we gonna do online play? Bout we're gonna, is where we're gonna figure it out. How are we gonna do matchmaking? Bout is how we will solidify the actual idea. So we're already doing that. This is just if we get funded. So after, that's gonna take roughly 60 days to get those things done. And then we have 300 days from that point to get Blitz in early access. Uh, that's just on Steam. That's the only platform we're worried about right now. And then roughly 600 days after that, or near the end of year two, that's when Blitz would have its 1.0 release. Um, and so I got who's gonna build this future. Got Elliot's on that list. And then uh, these are other people that have given some form of, hey, if you get funding, here's my price for how much I will want for a year, and they will join and jump in there. And so things that are past three years, so things that we can't really like be like, yeah, it's gonna happen this many days in and all that. So lots of local tournaments trying to build that up. And then the biggest one is the Blitz Open. So this is where anyone can, that is a team owner, their team can compete and be number one. So our Super Bowl. Um, and then lots of cosmetic DLC or lots of vending machines, which also means lots of income. Um, and then director mode. So this is where you can actually, um, when you're playing the game, it automatic, you can record where everyone was at at any point, and this was sort of like a set, so then this allows you to have like your own editor in there where you can go in and then re-watch any of your old clips, part of the spectator mode, um, and then see like, oh, what was this person doing wrong? What was this? And then your team can review all of your games together, and that's part of that premium package because that involves a lot of data stuff. The one stick mode is years on and then clubhouses and then spectator mode where you can just drop into most games and just watch them live. And then because we're making competitive games, that's the idea in the future, we want our fighting game that we've been working on and we've been running into issues on its prototype. And so that's why it's a future game and not the game we're going on now. Um, we've, the puzzle game, uh, so 
have you, did you guys even know that Tetris is a puzzle game? I mean, competitive game that there are tournaments? Okay, cool, I was just making sure. Um, not everyone does. So there is this weird market that's not huge, but we feel we can be king in for competitive puzzle games. Um, and Bout is also our first stab at that, and Bout is not it, just so you know. Um, but we are continuing on so that we can finish it and be done with it. And then our racing slash our Mario Kart game. All right. So sources, there were random things and statements that I said, so here are the sources for those. And then this is the demo hey, hey. video. Oh, God, I don't want to listen to me. I mean, like, I don't want to hear that. So basically, this is the rundown. Can you guys even see that? So this is me shooting the ball so that you guys can see. You kind of already saw the GIF of that. There's a bunch of stuff. There's a reason why I cut up the GIFs, because it's two minutes and all of that. Um, while I'm saying this, I'm also, I run the Unreal Engine meetup group. We meet every third Thursday, and we built this in Unreal. Um, I'm just biased towards Unreal, so shout out to them. Um, so the next thing, you collect the balls. They have dispensers around, so depending on where people keep going, we'll make the balls dispense, they'll kind of pool in areas, so the game kind of shifts like, hey, we've been going here and using all that pool of balls, so let's go to this other area. Uh, this is the athlete mode, where you can see that. Uh, all of these are bots, these aren't other people playing. This is not live right now, we just made a bunch of bots and had them running around. Uh, this is that focus tool, so it's focusing in on that one ball, and it looks pretty fluid, like it keeps looking at it and, you know, like I'm not using the mouse at all, I was just jumping around. Uh, that's one of the bad guys, and so I shoot. Oh, I don't shoot them. But they're running around. They have their own AI. Um, the quick lesson that I learned about AI, it doesn't, it's not about making it look smart. You just can't make them look stupid. These guys are actually really stupid, and all we figured out to do was make sure they didn't run into walls. That's all we did, and it works fine for right now. Uh, but... Um, bots will be used for testing, but the real goal is to always have real people and go with teams and then ranking teams. And so that was that. So that was my info. So that was the end of the presentation part. And then um, I was asking for feedback from anyone in the audience on either the game idea, the pitch, anything that you're like, I didn't like this, um, you need to fix this, or I didn't understand that is what I was going for. So, what do we got? Uh, so, with those sort of like clubhouses, are those going to be similar to like guild houses or something like World of Warcraft? Or like yeah, okay. but it's limited to only 20 people. Okay. So, it's not, like, it's not like a huge guild where, especially like EVE Online has like thousands of people in yeah. theirs, right? It, the idea is you keep them small so that hey, it, they always feel like an exclusive club. To go over in this, because it's just one of those like weird details, because they, the way the game's built, we have practice modes, but you can just do a, hey, here's people in our area, I just wanna play games with friends. You can then set up a practice mode with them and be like, okay, we're gonna run a game, but I wanna watch you on this team, you on this team, and then like switch it all up so that you can just see. Yeah, custom games like that, that are all peer-to-peer -peer that aren't on taking up our service, they're just out there playing. So there'll be people that are playing the game even though it doesn't look like so they're spending. The, like, saving replays of games, are mm -hmm. those be saved on your end or on the player? So we were gonna do on our end on the, which is why it's not in the 1.0 version because it's like this needs to succeed in order for that to happen. Um, it was more of the, because you, you use Unreal. Uh, like Fortnite already has it all built in already where basically it's looking at like, hey, here's your X, Y, and Z of this person, put them here and stuff, and then you just know the size of the maps and stuff. That's how that would be stored. But it's only storing those values. It starts filling in those characters. It's actually not... It's like three kilobytes, I think, is what it was. And then what's big is you have to have the game installed and stuff like that. So the... It's not big, but the idea is after so long, it's going to get big and need to be its own. And add up quick. And so... Do you, do you have any ideas for like, how you... What I've been basing everything on? Uh, 
they let me make a game on the Xbox, so I've just been biased towards Microsoft. Like, oh yeah, they'll they'll do this, and so they have. Uh, I can probably look it up here, but they just unleashed uh, their new Azure gaming uh, stuff that like you can with like a the like this is a two hundred dollar laptop, right? For presentations, I can go on there and go to one of their virtual machines, and it already has like Unreal installed and all of that, and so they're giving. Uh, indie developers, once you're accepted in the program, like I think it's like 4,000 hours per person for free that you could just go and work on your game. But then that's just for that. So for other services, they have a bunch of free ones. And so what they have is a thing called PlayFab. And PlayFab is a live ops service, live op service that allows for all of that stuff to be stored, but also your economy. Like, yeah, this person did buy this, and this is their login. And it's like, oh, this person played on PlayStation, and then they went over their Xbox. You know, oh, let's make sure their information is correct because now they're playing on a different platform and stuff. And so Azure, PlayFab, Microsoft, that was my current answer. Um, does that clearly answer your thing? Or I feel like I went on a weird path there. OK, cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was interested in uh, your mention of the uh, safety meditation mini game. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really useful part, part to have to care about the safety of the players. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is, uh, how are you balancing that sort of um, uh, directed mindfulness uh, with the flow state that is so important, especially in these sort of games? So as far as I've gotten on that is I have a book, this is not the answer you're looking for, I have a book from an uh, eSports um, physician that was like, hey, these are the injuries people are getting, and I was trying to avoid those injuries. Uh, how we're gonna do out the game, like I have a list of like, what's 100 possible games that we could do, and I have like 50 of those, but actually implementing and testing and prototyping, none of that has started yet, it's been, can we make sure the bots work and stuff like that? So it's, uh, it hasn't been prototyped yet, but the quick one, um, it's actually, the, the other companies that did it um, really well was uh, Complex, they're an eSports universe, or Complexity, they're, uh, they're owned by Dallas, uh, wait, Dallas Football? What, uh, Cowboys, there we go. Um, they own it, and so at their place, they have entire rooms for them where they have like iPads that's like, okay, put your hand here, go to there. Can you stretch that far? You know, try and do these things and like memorization things and stuff like that. So they had their own custom software built in, and I saw that after I was reading the book, and I was like, well, why can't we just do this in a game? And then I looked into it, and I was like, you can do it in a game. So that kind of, um, I don't have a clear answer on what the path for the mindfulness of it is. It's more if we notice, hey, you're, you're seeming aggressive or something, to be like, hey, maybe you should go into recovery mode and call it a day. Um, I don't want to go down the road of like we, though, where they're like, uh, did you do we fit? And it's like, hey, guess what? You know, nine-year-old, you're fat. You know, you don't want to go down that road. You want to make sure it's like, no, this is about you recovering and stuff like that. And so. Um, Right now, it's theoretical and like not a prototype. Well, I've done different mini games, but not a clear like this is going to be in there and that's going to help people. Uh, part of the idea behind funding the game is we can put a doctor and actually have hire someone to be like, what do we actually want for that side? What's up? So, where do you think these uh, like recovery games are going to take place? Are they going to be like in the clubhouses or are they going to be? No, no, it's going to be included. So, like, when you open the game, three windows that are like train, perform, recovery, that's like the opening. So it'll be like Blitz League, train, perform, recovery. And then you kind of figure out where you want to go from there. Okay, so you have to act, like actively go into your recovery mode, or? You have to, uh, for initially, yeah, you would want to go in there and do stuff like that. Um, but I'm, we're trying to figure out, like, we don't have like heat maps to be like, hey, we're noticing you're not going, shooting as fast as you used to, so maybe you should do a test run and stuff like that. Um, doing that with the live ops, because you because you have to do it like, or you guys play Call of Duty, or you at least know it exists, right? They monitor all of that sort of stuff, so we're just basically gonna say like, hey, it looks like you're having issues. Um, and then also, I don't know if, I mean, it's not considered health, so we don't want it to like, go down that road of like, hey, you're not supposed to be tracking that sort of information and put it in a game that's public even though, you know.
So there might be weird flaws. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have a question. Have you been injured playing a game? I know you don't have to answer that if you don't want to. Okay. I do play for like Steve and my father. Okay. So I am used to like, you know, you do get like strain injuries. Yeah. Right. Especially on these goals. But I did have a question about your observations. Yeah. So the idea behind that is uh, you're on a controller, right? And then you have just the thumbstick. So I can move a camera around essentially pretty easily. I don't have to have any other motor function like that. And then you would basically be moving the camera around inside of the game and following players or like, hey, let me line up and get a shot of these people, you know, things like that. That would help you. Um, and then you would have like its own scoring system. When we tested it, basically like there's like a center thing to be like, a cone to be like, hey, do you have like two or three people in the frame? Okay, now move it over here and get two or three people. Um, and so whenever you're doing like a broadcast, uh, you're, tr you're essentially watching those people and then they get rated on afterwards on their performance. Okay. Um, you said you watched Siege. Mm -hmm. I really like their like, like, Yeah. Like, Right. This is the lineup you had and we're doing wrong. Um, but that, having good, you know, it's like they're a good recap. Like for any sports, having a good recap is very important. But uh, casters, casters' ability to inspect the game. So the, the quick answer to that is third party services. Um, there's like two that I think are trustworthy and one of them did end up working with Siege. So like when you go on there, you know how you can like press little buttons and like look at the layers of the maps and stuff? That's all a third party service. Um, and then I don't know what engine Siege was in, but they made it sound like Unreal and Unity, you can use their plugin and all of that, but it's an expensive plugin. But at that rate, if you're getting that many views and stuff, it's worth it. So. Uh, um, the also the one button thing that was mainly for people that are doing casting and stuff like that so that they can like go in there and watch that sort of stuff and compete in there but it's not set in stone yet as you can tell it's just a prototype and an idea and like hey we're hoping this happens you know so oh what do we got so break even point I wasn't really worried about like it's going to cost this much or anything, but if we were going to do it all the expensive way, it would be 10.7 million. So that's all of the servers for multiple years. That's hiring a bunch of people and they get raises and they, the quick answer is for every employee that you have, they're going to cost you 10 grand per month. Uh, that's whether or not that's building cost, insurances, um, what's the other, 401ks, things like that. It doesn't mean they're actually taking that in. That's just how much they're going to cost per person. So for the amount of people that we were expecting to build out the game and take uh, two years to get to release and then five-year plan of what it would take to actually make it through everything and like really take it off was 10.7 million. But I mean, like if you have like, oh, we go to early access, you might, we might be breaking even in early access. Then we work on the next one. Um, so I mean, the quick example would be we get funded for 10.7 million and then it's uh, uh, it only costs however many sales that is of a mixture of the two um, owners certificate and then the vending machines and so uh, the exact number we would have to look at it and also 
It doesn't mean we're actually gonna spend 10.7 million. It might just be like, hey, you're given three or maybe only no millions, and that's what you have to make this game with. And so you make it work based on that. Who did your concept art? Uh, which one? Let me, okay. So 2D was this girl named Lydia that's in town. The 3D was Marco in Brazil. This was stolen. This was a Fiverr project of a guy that all he wanted to do was um, landscape, like interiors and stuff. And so he did a really good job. And this was stolen off ArtStation. And I say stolen because we're not using it anywhere. It's just like representation and stuff. Um, is that? Okay, cool. I didn't really, I don't think I have any more after that. So that's, that's all I have. I went with, thank you guys for your feedback. That's what, I know this is like a selfish talk. So I was like, I need your guys' stuff. So thank you for joining in on that. So um, I'm gonna say thank you for allowing me here and all that. Yeah. <laughs>